phasor quantity is nothing more than a shorthand notation that electrical engineers use to represent sinusoidally oscillating uh, signals, okay? So if in the time domain, we have a signal that looks like V of T is equal to VM cosine omega T plus some phase angle theta V, or alternatively, a current waveform of the form IM cosine omega T plus theta I. Based on our previous work, let's call this intermediate step the mixed domain. This time domain signal is simply the real part of a complex signal. V e of T is equal to VM E to the J omega T plus theta V. And our current is the real part of a complex signal I of T is equal to I M E to the J omega T plus theta I. So what we are doing with this step is effectively saying this complex representation V is equal to VM E to the J omega T plus theta V carries the exact same amount of information as our time domain representation, VM cosine omega T plus theta V. I am making that claim because both signals oscillate at the same angular frequency, omega. Both signals have the exact same amplitude, VM, and both signals have the exact same phase angle, theta V. And obviously that's true for our current representation as well. Uh, both signals oscillate at omega, at an angular frequency of omega. Omega, both signals have an amplitude of IM, and both signals have a phase angle of theta I. What electrical engineers have done is what's called suppressing the frequency characteristics of these signals, okay? And they do that because if we have a circuit that is excited at a particular frequency. So if I have a generic circuit, linear black box network, doesn't matter literally what's in it, as long as it's linear circuit components, and I hook up a voltage source that's oscillating at a frequency, a sinusoidal voltage, voltage source that's oscillating at an angular frequency of, let's say, omega is equal to 10 radians per second, I should observe that my response, so every voltage and current inside that linear black box network will also oscillate at that exact same frequency. So whatever frequency I excite the circuit at is what all of my waveforms should look like. They should either be, have some relationship to omega or they should be zero. There is literally no other option because Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law force that to happen, okay? So what I mean by that, just as a quick aside here, is that if I have a current source that is 10 cosine 30T plus 15 degrees amps, and I connect it to a network. You don't have to know what's inside it at all. Because that current, let's call this I of T over here, is flowing into the network, we know for a fact 
that at steady state, the voltage drop across the terminals of this guy has to be some voltage magnitude cosine 30T plus some phase angle theta V, just like when we connected a DC voltage source to a linear black box network. We saw that all of our voltages and currents were DC quantities. If we connect a sinusoidal voltage source or current source, we should see that all of our voltage and current signals are sinusoidal quantities, and they're all going to oscillate at that same omega. Okay. So electrical engineers decided then that carrying around that omega information is redundant because it's going to be in every single quantity. And since it's everywhere, it might as well be nowhere because it's not giving us anything new. So from that, they settled on what's called a phasor domain representation or a frequency domain representation of voltage and current signals. So I'm no longer going to use an equal sign because they're not equal. It's just a shorthand representation where the only bits of information that are carried are the phase angle and the magnitude, okay? So we would have VM angle theta V and IM angle theta I. I want to be very clear about this. We started with a cosine function in the time domain. So in order to convert into the frequency domain, any signal that we're interested in has to be represented by a cosine function, okay? Particularly a cosine function with a positive magnitude. The value of the phase angle is entirely unimportant, but we need this quantity VM or IM to be positive, and we need to be dealing with a cosine function, not a sine function. So how do we force sine functions to look like cosine functions? Anybody remember? So trig identities, right? So sine omega T looks like cosine omega t plus or minus what? So it's definitely 90 degrees. Should it be plus 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees? Let's find out. Should be fairly trivial. If I graph, A sine function. So this is just an arbitrary sine function. We know that sine at t is equal to zero should be zero degrees. Or excuse me, uh, sine of zero degrees should be zero. So it should start here. And then do this, right? A cosine function. should start at one and go like this. So a sine function is simply a cosine function that's time shifted to the right by some phase angle. Well, we know that that angle is 90 degrees. So a shift to the right means that the sine on our phase angle should be negative, right? because we're making things happen later in time. So that's why the angle should be negative. If we're making things happen earlier in time, then we get a positive angle. All right. So that's one big identity that we're gonna have to rely on. The other one would be negative cosine omega t is equal to positive cosine omega t and then a shift of what angle? 180. 
plus or minus? Trick, yeah, exactly right. Trick question, does not matter. Positive 180 or negative 180, both perfectly fair game. All right. So with these two identities, we should be able to convert any sinusoidal signal into a cosine signal having a positive amplitude. And that will in turn allow us to get a phasor representation. So just to reiterate, absolutely have to have our time domain signal in this form, positive amplitude, cosine, omega t plus some phase angle in order to represent it in the frequency domain with this phasor. Okay. All right. So Let's talk about phasor relationships for circuit elements. Let's start with a resistor. Right. So for a resistor, if I have a voltage drop across the resistor, V of T, and the current flowing through the resistor, I of T, what is the relationship between those two quantities, V of T and I of T? Yeah, Ohm's law, V is equal to I times R. All right, so let's say that we have a sinusoidal voltage, Vm cosine omega t plus theta v and a sinusoidal current i of t is i m cosine omega t plus theta i and we're going to recognize that this is just the real part of vm e to the j omega t plus theta v and our current waveform is simply the real part of I m e to the j omega t plus theta i. If we substitute in these mixed domain relationships, what we will find is that Vm e to the j omega t plus theta v is equal to I am e to the j omega t plus theta i. Everybody okay with that? Hopefully fairly straightforward. Oh, multiplied by r, my apologies. So, I can break my exponential function e to the j open parentheses omega t plus theta v into the product of two exponentials, right? Um, so what I mean by that is I could say that this is vm e to the j omega t multiplied by e to the j theta v. Everybody okay with me splitting that exponential up in that way? Just as a quick aside, all I am saying is that e to the x multiplied by e to the y is e to the x plus y, and then going in the opposite direction. 
this is going to give me I am multiplied by R e to the J omega T e to the J theta I. And now I'm going to suppress my frequency term by eliminating it from both sides, leaving me with Vm e to the j theta v is equal to I m r e to the j theta i. So this complex number here, Vm e to the j theta v, what information does it contain? Magnitude and phase angle, which is the exact same thing as what our phasor representation contains, right? This is a shorthand notation for this, where we don't want to have to keep writing e to the j, blah, blah, blah. So Vm e to the j theta v is literally identical to Vm angle theta v, which is in turn just our phasor voltage v. And on the right hand side, we have R times I am angle theta I, or R times phase return I. From this, we can easily see that Ohm's law in the frequency domain is the same as Ohm's law in the time domain. V is equal to I times R, except now in the frequency domain, we're using phasor quantities. If we look at this intermediate step here where we have e, uh, Vm e to the j theta v is equal to Im r e to the j theta i, we can see uh, a couple of things here, right? So on both sides of the equal sign, we have exponential form complex numbers. Um, so that means that the magnitude on the left-hand side has to equal to the magnitude on the right-hand side. And the phase angle on the left hand side has to equal to the phase angle on the right hand side for those two numbers to be equivalent. So from that, we can easily determine Vm is simply Im multiplied by R and theta V must be equal to theta I across a resistor. So we can literally just apply Ohm's law with magnitudes to figure out what's going on. And if we know one phase angle, we have to know both because a resistor does not introduce a phase shift between the voltage and the current. All right, any questions on the resistor? I am expecting you to understand this and to be able to apply it, the fact that the phase angles are the same thing. And it's going to be very important. Let's work with an inductor next. So we have some inductance L. If there is a voltage V of T across it and a current I of T flowing through it, what is our relationship? Um, that relates these two quantities I and B. The derivative based relationship. B is L di by dt. So if we're using the same mixed domain quantities, V is equal to E to the J omega T plus theta V, I is equal to I M E to the J omega T plus theta I. This is going to look like V M E to the J omega T plus theta V is equal to L times the derivative with respect to time of I M E to the J omega t plus theta i. We can split our exponential functions again. So 
like so. Well, let me ask you guys a question. The quantity e to the j theta i is that time dependent quantity? No. So we could pull this out of the derivative and mathematically have no issue whatsoever, right? Yeah, I am as well. So let's go ahead and do that just for this argument here. BM e to the j omega t e to the j theta v is equal to L times I m e to the j theta i times the derivative of e to the j omega t. Everybody okay with the algebra that we've done here? What is the derivative of e to the j omega t? Exactly right. So for those of you who don't remember your basic calculus, the derivative of e to the alpha t is simply alpha e to the alpha t, where alpha in this case is the quantity j omega. So that's going to give us Vm e to the j omega t e to the j theta v is equal to L i m. All right, let's put it up front. J omega L i m e to the j omega t e to the j theta i. And then obviously the e to the j omega t's can be canceled out on both sides and suppressed again. And this leaves us with Vm angle theta V, which is nothing more than our phasor voltage V multiplied by J omega L times I am angle theta I, which is nothing more than J omega L times our phasor current I. So, if we go back to this intermediate step again, what can we say about these complex numbers, right? Again, they're nothing more than a exponential form complex number on the left-hand side and an exponential form complex number. Well, actually, we've got a little bit of a hiccup here on the right-hand side. So let me, let me take that back slow. Okay. Obviously, what we have on the left, Vm e to the j theta v is an exponential form complex number. What we have on the right-hand side is I m e to the j theta i, which is an exponential form complex number being multiplied by j omega l, which is a rectangular form complex number. So how do we convert that quantity j omega l to a either an exponential form complex number or a polar form complex number. Sure. So the suggestion here, uh, a simple way to, to understand what was just suggested is to look at a complex plane where this is our imaginary axis, and this is our real axis. So if we go one unit out into the real axis, in rectangular form, this looks like one plus J zero. And in polar form, this looks like one E to the J zero, right? Because our phase angle is measured with respect to the positive real axis. So when we're on the positive real axis, obviously the phase angle should be zero degrees. If we go out one unit in the imaginary axis, this is gonna look like zero plus J one. Well, the angle formed here 
is obviously 90 degrees. So another way to represent that is one E to the J 90 degrees. So if J in rectangular form is one E to the J 90 degrees, then that tells us that we have Vm is equal to omega L times I m. The magnitude on the left hand side of the equal sign is equal to the magnitude on the right hand side of the equal sign. And it also tells us that theta V, the phase angle on the left hand side of the equal sign, is equal to theta I plus the 90 degrees contributed by J. So theta I plus 90 degrees. All right. That is absolutely correct. The current lags the voltage by 90 degrees. So so let, let's let's think about that. Okay, uh, how many of you guys remember leading and lagging? All right. I need do. Let's do a quick thing here. Let's say that I have signal one, let's just call it V1 of T is eight cosine 65T plus 12 degrees volts. And V2 of T is 11 cosine 65T minus 80 degrees volts. If I drew these on a phase uh, diagram, V1, which I'm going to do in red, would look something like this, where this angle is 12 degrees. V2, which I'll do in blue, would look something like this. I'll call this angle negative 80 degrees. So by how much does V1 lag V2? Thought you guys knew this. Is it? What direction? Okay, so if we want how much does V one lag V two? Where do we start measuring from? V one or V two? We're measuring how V1 compares to V2, right? So we want to know by how much one the quantity V1 lags V2, which means we need to start our measurement at V2. Okay. So this is our reference for our comparison. When we are measuring lagging, do we measure in a clockwise fashion or a counterclockwise fashion? Clockwise. Okay. So we measure in a clockwise fashion because we're getting more and more, more and more of a negative angle, right? So it's occurring later and later in time as we rotate around. Okay. So leading is this way. Lagging is this way. So I would argue that it's not 92 degrees, it's 360 minus 92 degrees, whatever that is, 268 degrees, I think, if my internal math is correct. So a more positive phase angle means that it occurs at an earlier point in time. A more negative phase angle 
means that it occurs at a later point in time. Okay, so we could say that V1 leads V2 by 92 degrees, or it lags V2 by negative 268 degrees. So going back to Brandon's question, leading and lagging in an inductor. The phase angle of the voltage will always be 90 degrees more positive than the phase angle of the current, right? That's what this mathematical representation here literally has to mean, which means the voltage will always be leading the current or the current will always be lagging the voltage by exactly 90 degrees. Any other questions about behavior of an inductor? at least with regards to what we've talked about here before we move along to capacitances. All right. Slightly too far. I think this will be the last thing that we'll talk about today because we're running a little low on time because I spent a solid 30 minutes yelling at you. Um, we have a capacitor C over which a voltage drop B of T appears and a current I is flowing into the positive polarity terminal. What's our derivative based relationship here? I is equal to C dV by dT. So since we did something extraordinarily similar to this, Mathematically, a moment ago, I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump forward a couple of steps here. Obviously, this is going to be I m e to the j omega t e to the j theta i will be equal to c times the derivative of d m e to the j omega t e to the j we can take the em and the e to the j theta v out uh, from inside the derivative operation, giving us im e to the j omega t e to the j theta i is equal to c vm e to the j theta v multiplied by the derivative of e to the j omega t. We know that the derivative of e to the j omega t is j omega e to the j omega t. We did that just a minute ago. And so that leaves us with i m e to the j omega t e to the j theta i is equal to j omega c v m e to the j omega t e to the j theta v. Suppressing our frequency terms gives us this. Um, which obviously should be phasor I is equal to J omega C phasor V. And if we look at this guy here, our intermediate step, we know that I M should be omega C multiplied by V M and theta I is equal theta V plus 90. So for a capacitor, the current is always 90 degrees more positive than the voltage, or excuse me, the phase angle of the current is always 90 degrees more positive than the phase angle of the voltage, which means the current leads the voltage or the voltage lags the current. All right, so what I want to talk about on, uh, let's say, what day of the week is today, Wednesday? Yeah, what I want to talk about on Friday is we're going to take these phasor domain relationships that we've developed for our three 
uh, circuit develop elements of interest, uh, resistors, inductors, and capacitors, and then develop um, the concept of impedance, which should largely be a review, or at least I hope it is, and the concept of admittance, which I don't know that you guys have been introduced to yet. 